Welcome to Porto. Would you look at that view? The pastel buildings along the riverbank, the Rebellos ferrying tourists downstream, and the smell of Francesinias filling the streets. Porto is a city that lends its name to one of the most important wines ever to exist. Port. You might not know it, but Port changed the way the planet thinks about wine. It's historic. Port was one of the first non-perishable wines in existence. It's diverse. Port comes in over a dozen styles. It's age-worthy. You can lay a port down for decades. It's versatile. Port can be had with meals, cigars, with dessert, as dessert, as an aperitif, in cocktails, for special occasions, or for an ordinary Tuesday night. Most importantly, and what some people forget, it's simply a wine. A wine that I plan on enjoying a lot during my time here. Welcome to Porto, and welcome to V's for Vino. Welcome to downtown Porto. It's the second largest city in Portugal and the heart of port wine. Known as O Porto in Portuguese, this city lends its name to the country of Portugal and its signature wine, Port. Up until the last decade or so, Porto remained largely undiscovered by US tourists, though for the life of me, I have no idea why. For one, the architecture rivals any European destination. Towering cathedrals, giant plazas with 500-year-old churches. You also get expansive parks modern museums, and bridges designed by the same engineer as the Eiffel Tower. Even the train station is a work of art. But the lifeblood of this city, without question, is the Douro River. To understand this region, you have to start with the Douro River. The river begins all the way in the center of Spain and spans 557 miles to the Atlantic Ocean. It travels through what is called the Douro Valley, which is the wine region for port. You see, the grapes and wine used for port aren't actually made in Porto. They're made in the Douro Valley. The finished wine is then transported downriver to be stored and aged in the cellars in the area south of downtown Porto called Via Nova de Gaia. This is Via Nova de Gaia, right across the river from where we just were. For hundreds of years before trucks took over, barrels of port were transported from the Douro Valley on traditional flat-bottomed boats called rebelos. The boats unloaded here, where the barrels would then head to the various port lodges to be aged. Here behind me, there's more than 60 lodges, some of the names you'd probably recognize. Once the wine was aged, bottled, and ready to go, the boats came back into play. You see, the history of port wine stems as much from necessity as it does from pleasure. Nowadays, we often take for granted planes and trucks and forget that at one time, the best and sometimes only method of long distance transport was boats. The British have long had a taste for fine wine. However, it was too cold to grow grapes in Britain, so for centuries they imported wine from the French. But in the 17th century, Britain and France started squabbling, which, like most squabbles in history, led to wars and trade embargoes. Eager to find a replacement for their steady flow of wine, the British looked to Portugal, who they were already trading dried fish, wool, and other goods with via boat. But there was a problem. Yes, the boat could make it from Portugal to Britain, but the wine, not so much. Winemaking back then wasn't like how it is today. Wines were perishable and had a very short shelf life. Hard to imagine nowadays. But the wines that were transported by boat ended up spoiling during the long journey to Britain. In response, shippers started adding brandy to the casks of wine to help preserve it for long trips. And just like that, the tradition of port was born. Today, neutral brandy is still added to port wine just like in the 1700s, though instead of being added after the wine is complete, the brandy is now added during the fermentation process. The wine was a hit in Britain, and eventually the British started taking over its aging and exporting processes. This is why many of Portugal's port houses have British sounding names. By the mid 18th century, port's popularity had grown and had a reputation to uphold. Marquis of Pombal, the man who essentially ruled the Portuguese empire at the time, decided to see to it that port wine was always up to snuff. He created the first demarcated or regulated wine region in the world in 1756, far before DOCs or AOCs in Italy and France. 
He established a governing body that regulated production techniques, geography, and standards for port wine that helped cement in traditions. In the century since, port has fallen in and out of and back into fashion, but it'll always stand as one of the most historic, iconic wines in the world. Of all the logos in the wine world, I don't think there is one quite as recognizable as Sandemann. The Don, as he is called, is a brooding silhouette. The Spanish hat, the Portuguese student's cape, the glass of port in hand. It makes me want to cozy up with a glass of ruby and a good mystery novel on a stormy night. But luckily for me, there is plenty of port to be had and sunny weather when I went to meet George Sandemann the seventh generation of his family's business at the house that bears his name. George in the George. In the George. George in the George. Not named George on the wall. That's his exact name, <laughs> George on the wall. <laughs> oh, here come the cocktails. It's a 10 year old tawny with vodka. Okay. Spice. Walnuts. Walnuts on the rim. That is very oh, that is lovely. You know, there's this trend now to use port as the sweetener in you know, the sweetening ingredient in cocktails, but it's not a new thing. The first mentions in written terms is Jerry Thomas. And that's one of the reasons when we started our whole adventure going into cocktails and porting cocktails, besides believing that port is a wonderful wine to be in a cocktail, but we like to have some historical background to it. And that's where we found a lot of it. We enjoyed our first course, which was Algera, a smoked sausage wrapped in cabbage leaf served over a multi-grain porridge. The smoky flavor contrasted the sweet nuttiness of the cocktail beautifully. We are here in what is essentially like a, a Sandeman campus, which I think is really fun. This, the George, the restaurant, there's a terrace where you can just get cocktails and there's this cool box car, uh, like old train cars doing cocktails. There's obviously the cellars and the tasting rooms you can visit. And then there's like a hotel hostel. These were the original, I mean, the, the original Sandeman buildings. Sandeman came in and took over the cellars here in 1811 because of the location right next to the river. Essentially, these were offices. You know, the question was, how do you take this building and keep it alive? The main offices, including where I used to work for a while, is now a lovely suite okay. which looks out onto the river. Some of the inner offices were all converted into uh, a hostel environment uh, uh, where you have these are bunk beds in the shape of casks. Oh, cool. So it's quite nice and very nicely done. It's uh, run by some really, really professional, good people. One of the great advantages that Thank there is with Port is you have this diversity of flavors. Well, it's a versatile wine in the sense that, okay, you have the three main types, white, tawny, ruby. Then within that, you have all your subcategories. Yes. Then within that, you can have it as in a cocktail, you can have it with dessert, but you can also have it, I, I feel like port doesn't necessarily need to be relegated to dessert, no? You can drink a, a white, a chilled white port uh, with a starter. Classic is ruby port, a chilled ruby port with a chocolate mousse. Here, we're, we're gonna have another experience. I mean, yeah. I've had a, about a hundred of these since I've got here. This is white port and tonic. Cheers. White port and tonic, Cheers. Which is my new favorite cocktail. Low alcohol cocktail. The sweetness of the white port plays really well with kind of that bitter tonic water. It's, it's really, really great. And this is a very popular drink here. It's a very popular drink. As you said, I mean, many people think of port as being one thing. I mean, you know, a lot of people think of port as being a sort of full body ruby wine, which you drink at the end of a meal and probably around the holiday time and probably when your mother-in-law is over. <laughs> yeah. you know, and she probably likes it better than you do because it's served warm. But then well, no you, offense, but sometimes it's seen as an old English thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> the yeah, older yeah, absolutely, English generation. Absolutely. But when you take it out of that context and you show people that served chilled, served in a large glass like a wine, served with food, on ice with a slice of orange, it makes a really nice aperitif. White port and tonics are so easy to make, it's gonna be your summer go-to, I promise. Course two was seared thin cut ribeye and migas, a classic Portuguese dish of leftover bread moistened and mixed with sausage and vegetables. It's very similar to stuffing and it's one of my favorite Portuguese comfort foods. 
Sandman was founded by George Sandman, borrowed some money from his father, bought wines and started selling them and, and, and made a successful business out of it. The company just sort of grew and became a very well established shipper of ports. And then in the 1920s, Sandman was being run by uh, Walter Sandman. And I mean, in those days, there were no marketing agencies, right? Sure. There were printers, and the printers hired artists to develop art, which they could take around to somebody and say, wouldn't this be wonderful for you to promote your product with? And he bought this poster for advertising, which later on became the symbol of Sandman. To me, the really stunning move was that three years or four years later, they decided to take this symbol and put it on the label. That probably was one of the great moves. And it's so iconic. I mean, there is, I can't, in the wine world, not just in port, I don't know if there's a more iconic image than the Don. I can't say there is. Yeah. The last drink was from my favorite family of cocktails, a fizz. Egg whites, lemon, Sandeman Founders Reserve Ruby Port, and violet syrup, served with a chocolate lava cake. Is this relatively easy to make? No, it's a giant pain. <laughs> <laughs> to, to do it properly, you have to shake until your arm falls off. Welcome to the most important part of this episode. What is port? The answer's a bit long, but hang with me, the information is worth it. Now there's always been some confusion about port, so let's get one thing clear right off the bat. It's just wine. It's not a liqueur or a spirit like some people believe. Port is simply made from grapes, specifically a blend of grapes. There are about 110 different grapes allowed in port, but in practice, 30 are most common and six in particular are almost always used. The process starts with regular must or unfermented grape juice. Nothing new here yet. From there, we'll start to see the difference between port and other wines. Port is a fortified wine, which means a clear neutral spirit. In this case, a 77% alcohol brandy is added mid-fermentation, making about a quarter of our final product brandy to three quarters wine. And this is what sets port apart from other wines. When the brandy is added, it raises the overall alcohol to 20% and kills the yeast. Winemakers do this when the yeast has eaten and converted only about half of the grape sugar to alcohol, and thus leaves the other half in the wine. This is why port is sweet, and I don't say that lightly. Most port has about 100 grams per liter of sugar, which puts it deliciously on par with Coca-Cola. So now at this point, we have a sweet, 20% alcohol, fortified wine. But the process doesn't stop there. Our wine now approaches a fork in the road before it can reach its final destination, its bottle, white, tawny, or ruby. Let's start simple. White port. This is the only port made from white grapes and the only port that is sometimes made dry. It's either standard white port or a reserve which has been aged in oak for seven years. These wines have flavors of apricot, roasted nuts, citrus, honey, and are great on their own or with tonic or soda as an aperitif. They're fun, fresh, and easy drinking. Next, we have tawny port. Tawny ports are aged in small barrels so the wine is exposed to oxygen from the breathable oak and has a lot of juice to wood contact. You can even see it in the color, hence its name, tawny. The wood and oxygen give tawny a signature nuttiness and oak presence. Flavors like dried fruit, coffee, caramel, toffee, cinnamon, almond, and toast are all common. From there, we have our subcategories of tawny port, and yeah, there's a bunch. First up, regular tawny, aged two years, Next is reserve, aged six years. Then you have what's called aged tawnies. 10 year, 20 year, 30 year, and 40 year. I mean, how crazy, right? How often can you drink a wine that's older than you, or close to your age anyway, at an affordable price? Also note that all these are the average age of the wine. I say average because most of these wines are blends of different vintages, or non-vintage. The longer a tawny wine ages, the more of those oxidative properties it takes on. They get smoother, more nutty, and take on flavors like butterscotch and vanilla. The last subcategory is Colleta Port, which is single vintage tawny. It's usually very high quality and aged at least seven years in barrel, but sometimes up to 50 before release. 
Easiest thing to remember about tawny ports, they can all be drunk when you purchase them. Just like white ports, tawny has been aged for you by the producer and won't really benefit from more aging. Okay, we're almost there. This brings us to where things get interesting. The boss level of ports, if you will. Ruby. While tawny ports remind us of brown things, caramel and nuts, ruby port reminds us more of fruit. This is because they're made from red grapes and aged in large oak barrels that impart very little oxygen or oak flavors. But it's in the subcategories where things get really exciting. Basic ruby port is the most popular style of port made and has flavors like blackberry, raspberry, cinnamon, and chocolate. Reserve ruby, sometimes called vintage character, special, or finest, has five years of oak aging, is full-bodied and richer than standard ruby, and is one of the best values in port wine. Both Ruby and Ruby Reserva are non-vintage, so you're drinking these right at release. Now let's talk vintages. This only applies to certain tawnies and rubies. A vintage year in the land of port is a really big deal. It's only declared by a producer about three to four times a decade when the producer decides it was an exceptional year. Vintage ports are made differently. Besides the grapes being from just a single vintage, they spend only about two to three years in oak, are bottled and then released immediately. Then you, the consumer, or the retailer, or the restaurant, are expected to age them in the bottle for 20 to 40 years until they're in their prime and ready to drink. But good things come to those who wait. This is the height of port wine. Rich, full-bodied, integrated tannins, licorice, plums, bramble, toffee, violets, tar, tea, spiced fruitcake. These wines are exceedingly complex. And while they aren't quite as affordable as the other styles, they're still relatively accessible. 20-year-old vintage ports can be had starting around $100. Finally, there's one last style, LBV or late bottle vintage. These are vintage ports made in years that aren't officially declared vintage years and are aged longer and bottled later than vintage ports, hence late bottle vintage. They're top quality wines, ready to drink on release, and a good approximation of vintage port, but at a lower price. You still with me? I know it was a lot, but it's worth demystifying a wine as special as port. If you're still scratching your head, try drinking a glass or two yourself to help bring it all into focus. Hey, Vino fans. I wanna to talk to you about signing up for Vino VIP. And since I don't wanna bother you with a ton of commercials while you're trying to watch the show, I'm gonna put all the cliche marketing angles into just this one. Here we go. I know we come off as a big production, but the reality is the entire operation is myself and a few other part-time employees. We're not affiliated with a studio or TV channel. We really wanna keep the show going, but literally can't do it without your help. So please, if the show has entertained you, helped you learn or pass a wine exam, if I've answered your DMs and questions, or if the show's just brought you value in any way, support the small business that provided it and join Vino VIP, which is our very own membership program. If you enjoy the show, joining Vino VIP is a must anyway. Membership starts at just $5 a month, and here's some of the benefits. Early access to all our videos, including new episodes of the show. Every quarter, I host a virtual tasting and Q&A just for VIP members. Every month, we raffle off wine glasses and prizes, and once a year, we even have a big winner who gets a personalized tasting where I send wine and food to your house and host a tasting for you and your friends. Plus, if you're a gold member or platinum member, you get your name in the credits of an episode. Kind of like this. I never want to charge for individual episodes, or worse yet, be unable to make the show at all, but that's why we need support from those of you who can. It's only $5 a month, which is less than a Starbucks coffee, so it's really in reach. Everybody assumes that their support won't make a difference, but I promise you it does. Look at all this pretty members-only content you're missing out on. Behind the scenes videos, episode commentaries, and full length interviews that can be seen nowhere else but our members-only section. The first month is free, you literally have nothing to lose. I know this was long, but everything I just said is 100% true. We have tens of thousands of fans, and even if a small percentage of you joined, we could keep making videos for you in the long term. And the last perk is that you can start watching episodes in the members section, and you don't have to hear this pitch or see ads ever again. Thank you to our existing Vino VIP members, and thanks for considering joining.
There are lots of places that oak age their wine, but Porto may be the only place in the world where the cellar defines the wine in both style and tradition. So George took me to the cellar to help me better understand. It starts off quite basic. So I mean, when you talk about ruby ports, they spend a small time in the cellar uh, because you want to keep them big and fruity. So what, what we age in these cellars here are basically the tawny ports. Okay. And tawny ports need a lot of oxidation. Uh, and this is one of the few occasions when oxidation is actually a good thing in wine because most people talk about you know, oxidation being bad. Here, these casks really are recipients which allow the wine to breathe. And that allows the wine to evolve from the big, red, young ports into these sort of wonderful, delicate, tawny ports with sort of lovely, you know, uh, amber colors, gold colors. These cellars are particularly important. I'd say the microclimate they live in. Yeah, it's, it's a little it's bit humid. humid. It's, yeah, it's humid. it's humid in here. And, and being right close to the river, means that even in the, in the hottest of summer days, the wine doesn't heat up. So we have a very stable temperature. It means the oxidation is slow, it's gradual, and the flavors don't burn. Okay. Um, yeah, so you don't want to cook the wine. We don't want to cook We're wine. not making Madeira, we're making port. We're making <laughs> yeah. port, exactly. But it is funny what you mentioned about oxygen, which is essentially that oxygen is the enemy until it's not, right? It's all about controlling Absolutely. it. The rubies, well, they, they'll spend a little time in barrel, right? Oh, yes. So the young rubies will spend some time in like this big oak that we see, we see on, on our left-hand side here. And these vats essentially allow some oxygen to get in, but really maintain what we want in rubies, which is the big, fresh, uh, plummy, yeah. fruity characteristics. Those wines, by the way, I mean, if you take a, a vintage port or a late bottled vintage and age it in bottle, the oxygen also gets in because the cork allows oxygen in. Yep. And they also evolve and eventually got the color of a 30-year-old tawny. It's interesting what you mentioned about location. Was it chosen because of the temperature or was it chosen based on necessity because of the river? It's a, it's a question of the, 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 the what came first, the chicken or the egg. But in this case, it was more necessity. Being here and having your barrels rolled across basically a short distance into here was much less expensive than being up on the hill. Yeah, okay? sure, sure. Because then you'd have to have an ox car take your barrel up. But there was another thing. Why is all the port on this side of the river and not on the other side of the river? That all has to do with taxes. Okay, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's taxes in the church. I mean, and God bless them both. So the Bishop of Porto had the right to tax all products, all wines, all merchandise that would come through a Porto. So the shippers would have their businesses on the other side, but their warehouses here because this wasn't oh. within his parish. I did wonder about that. I said, okay, why is it a different city even though it's uh, essentially right across the river? I'm really excited to, to get in. Do you want to go taste some of the wines? Oh, that would be, it's always a good thing. <laughs> Talking is wonderful, but tasting is better. Yeah, let's do it. thing I notice is we have lined up glassware, not what I sometimes think of as port glasses. Port glasses. Yeah. Today we drink it like wine because it is wine. So a large glass allows you not only to appreciate the color, which is very beautiful, but also the aroma and then the taste. The first one is Founders Reserve, and this is a reserve ruby port. It's about five years old. You'll see it's very red in color primary characteristics that you're looking for in port. A lot of fruits, a lot of plums, uh, a lot of aroma. And I don't know if you, if you noticed, this is the tie-in, the heritage of Sandeman with art, tied in with two um, Portuguese artists here and recyclable canisters. Anyway, to the Let's wine. Let's do it. Interesting that uh, you, I think all these you have a little bit chilled. W what I find when, you, when it's chilled like this is you get the fruit aromas and you don't get the spirit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the alcohol. The alcohol. It's, a, I think, a lovely fruit aroma. Lovely fruit. And I do get some spice. I get and some nice spice. And yeah. some pepper spice. Yeah. And then on the palate, they were very primary. That's, you know, it's a younger, younger wine. Still mm -hmm. have five years age. Mm -hmm. But young Verport, extracted, ripe, kind mm -hmm. of fruit style, but that still has a freshness. A lot of people think of port as being sugary and sweet. And if it is, it's not good port. Yeah, you like, you're looking yeah. for that freshness to balance it exactly. out. 
And what that sugar does do is it gives that length on finish and that warming exactly. effect. Exactly. If it's done properly, it doesn't come off as sweet so much as length. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And clean. Yeah. And then and then what happens is you say, hmm, that tastes very good. Let me taste it again. <laughs> okay, so we go we go on to the second wine here. These vintage ports are the the wines that are considered the best if you want of the best so what happens is the house decides i've got a vintage i want to declare it as a vintage and they take it to the port wine institute which is the governing authority and their independent panel will taste it and say yes this qualifies if you made me say this is similar to something it kind of reminds me at least the nose a bit of like a meaty syrah at this age i mean this is a 2018 i mean this is a very young port it's a very young vintage port. You could be looking at aging this for, you know, 15 to 20 years without much of a problem. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it is, I mean, it's great right now. I have it's no delicious. problem drinking it's it delicious. today. It's delicious. But I do understand what you're saying, that this is the kind of wine that would have a lot of wonderful evolution in 15 to 20 yeah. years. Uh, unfortunately, as as my, as my I've experienced, time flies a lot faster than oh, one go. Okay. <laughs> so, so you can put down a, a 2018 and all of a sudden, it is you know, Wow. Oh my God. I could drink it now. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to change up the style yeah. now. We go, now we go into the, 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 the tawny style. Exactly. And here, here you see it perfectly because I mean, you have one wine, which is definitely ruby and another wine, which is losing that ruby character mm -hmm. and starting to develop yellows and golds and amber. And what's interesting about this, because this is a, a very young tawny, it really is kind of the next level of maybe our really young Ruby, right? It's not mm -hmm. so far off from it. And I like this when it's a, it wants something a little bit more mellow, yep. uh, a little bit more laid back. Mellow is a great way to describe this. I gotta tell you, this on ice, on ice? with yeah, like, with, a, with a little slice of orange. In the summer? In the summertime. Confusing is, I think for a lot of consumers is, when do you open these? Mm -hmm. Will they age? Should I age them? Normally what has this a tea top or bar stopper is something that is going to be used earlier. So it's bottled for drinking. For immediate consumption. Yeah, for immediate consumption. Okay. Whereas something that has a driven cork in it, the long cork in it, is something that you can lay down and keep for a period of time. The general guideline that is that if you're drinking a ruby port, you can keep them open and drink them for about a month. When you're talking about the tawny ports, you have a bottle of 20 or 30 year old tawny open for for 60 days. And oh, the tawnies can go long. longer. Because they're wines that have been exposed to oxygen. oxygen. Interesting. Yeah. So here, here, I mean, here you really see the evolution, not only of the color, but also the aroma, caramel and spice and vanilla and almonds. What's really lovely about this is on the, on the palate, those really burst through that caramel, kind of mm -hmm. caramelized orange peel, completely different from kind of what we've tasted before. Mm -hmm. And that's because you're seeing a draft that's about 20 years of difference, right? Yeah. So this is, this is what you're getting yeah. when you start to really put some age on it. Okay, the last one, and I have the stretch right over here. You get the 30-year-old Tony. We say it we say it very casually. We're having the 20 versus the 30. What were you doing 10 years ago? It really is a big difference, and so it takes a lot of commitment from your from your producer. This isn't the question of saying, well, I'm gonna keep this wine for 20 years and it'll become this wine and this wine for 10 years and it'll become that wine. The styles are completely unique. So that the 20 year old may come off as being a little bit fresher, the 30 year old is a little bit more intense. The finish on this is so tremendously long. Mm. I get a lot of fig character. All those things that we loved about this one, but just kind of a little heightened. It's more intense. It's more compact. Strangely enough, there are times when I find it overwhelming. To me, uh, mm. this is a, a wine that you could sit and drink, you know, and maybe have some rock for cheese with or something like this. This is a wine that you almost like going like, God, this is, you know, let me think here. Let me, you know, let me contemplate. Let me. I love this. I love that there's so many different styles for whatever the occasion might be. And we've only touched on some of them here. Mm -hmm. This is a tremendous kind of intro to me for port. So thank you so much. Interesting. We both went for the 30 on that one. <laughs> <laughs>
Did you guys know that on our website, we have the places we visited listed on each episode's page, the wines we drank available for sale, and our VIP section with bonus videos? I just thought I'd let you know. Nova de Gaia may be where the wines are cellared, aged, and bottled, but that's only half the story. The other half lies about an hour inland along the river. The Douro Valley is where the grapes are actually grown and later made into the wine that becomes port. The history of much of this land is tied to a single woman deemed a visionary of her time. Antonia Adelaide Fajera was an entrepreneur and pioneer for this region in the 1800s and was instrumental in helping it become what it is today. Luis Sotomayor, winemaker for Fajera Port, the brand that carries her name, tells me more. I'm so excited to try these wines. You know, Fajera was explained to me as the people's port, one of the oldest brands, but most importantly, I think it's always been Portuguese owned. Yes, you know, so always. many ended up being being British owned at some point, or at least aged and bottled, but this has always been kind of the Portuguese people's port, so. And, and, I, and with a Portuguese style. All the others, the port wine companies, they belong for uh, people who came here to buy the wine, and to sold the wine. Okay. But the Ferreira family, they are the first farmers to vinify it, their own grapes and sold the, the, the wines. I want to talk a little bit about how this region came to be. Dona Antonia, give me her story. So Dona Antonia, she's uh, she taking charge the, 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 the company. So when she dies, is one of the biggest companies in Portugal. What did she do during the 50 years or so that she owned the company that really helped you know turn it into what it is today she del developed a lot the company not only the company but also the, the region for example during the phylloxera problems she has a lot of properties in, in indoors and she is a property to the, to the government to do there all the works to try to to uh, to fight against that uh, that 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 disease where you are now is door superior Douro Superior in that moment doesn't belong to the, the, the Douro region. But she acquired some lands in that, in that area because she, she feels they will be very important in the development of the region. Yeah. She is one of the first to planting vineyards in that area, which is nowadays is something beautiful yep. and is from where they comes our better uh, Douro wine. The slope is so steep here. Douro is a huge uh, wine region. Yeah. And so in a so big uh, region, that we have different uh, orographies. In that area we, where we are, the orography are much more soft, for example, than in, in Simacorgo. In Simacorgo, the, the, the hills are much more uh, aggressive than, than here, which much more, more aggressive soft. than here? Yeah, here's much pretty more, aggressive. Yes, 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 yes. So how do you decide what makes a classic vintage year versus when you're going to do a, a Quinta vintage? In my opinion, we have much better quality now than, a, than a 30 years ago. Our LBVs now, they could be vintage at uh, 30 years ago or 20 or 30 years wow, ago. Wow, so yes. you think the because overall yes, quality yes. of port the has quality, improved? The quality uh, improved. Why? Because you understand much more the viticulture and you have much better technology. We only classify as wine as classic vintage when we feel we have the style of the, the, the company. Yep. Other years, we have beautiful wines. This is more a style of a property than a style of the company. That is the biggest difference between classic and single, single quinta. The quality could be similar, yeah. but the style is different. But the style is different. Is different. That is my biggest job during the harvest, is walk, walk in the, in the vineyard, taste the, the grapes, and to know if uh, the, when is the right moment to to harvest the, the grapes. Yeah. Luis explained to me how he knows when the skin is developed. 
the different types of schist soils, how he blends low altitude and high altitude plots. You could just tell he had a lot of wisdom to share. And before we had to taste, he had a surprise for me. It was harvest and production time when I was in the Douro in September. And once Luis makes the call to pick the grapes, the process is fast and furious. See, grapes need to get quickly from vine to fermentation. It has to happen in the same day. The harvest process goes as such. Luis gives the command. The grapes are picked and put in buckets, then bigger buckets, then trucks. There's about 700 grapes in a bottle of wine, so you do the math of how many bunches have to be picked to facilitate even a small winery. The trucks take them to the production center. The fruit is then dumped into the distemmer, which does exactly what it sounds like, separates the stems from the grapes. Next, the grapes are hand sorted to pick out any foreign bits like leaves or leftover stems. For most red wines, the grapes are then machine pressed, moved into tanks, and allowed to ferment with the juice and skins. But this is port wine. And the best port wines are still stomped by foot in a process called pijage in giant stone tubs called lagares. Sure, machines could be used, but producers will tell you that the action of your foot treading the grape is just hard enough to release the juice, but not so hard that you'll extract bitterness, something machines have trouble replicating. Plus, it's good old-fashioned tradition, done in groups, often to music. It reminds us of the combination of effort, joy, and teamwork that's required to make wine. Feeling the grapes between your toes, the hot and cool pockets that mark where fermentation has already begun, the effort it takes to lift your foot out of the must, which is more strenuous than you'd expect, trust me. It's like driving a stick shift in a world that's gone automatic. It's a nice reminder that while technology is great, there's something to getting your hands dirty, uh, should I say feet dirty, and doing the work the same way it was done hundreds of years before you arrived. Luis and I decided to do our sampling of Vajera Port back in the city of Porto. Little did I know, I was in for one of the most special tastings of my life. I don't think I've been ex this excited for a tasting in a long time. I don't know as much about vintage port as I would like. I work here 32 years. Each day is, is like a start. You're a new, still learning. A new, a, new, a, new, a new start. What we have here is, is a LBV, late bottle vintage. It is a wine with a great relationship price quality because yeah. it's not expensive. So this is a style that essentially spends a little extra time in oak versus a vintage, right? Yes. And he aged more two years, two years more in oak. So when he goes to bottle, is more drinkable than, than a vintage. What, what do we feel? Uh, is the aromas of the, the grapes, some spicy. I get, some so I get black, a lot of meat spice. Some, some, some black and, and some of... red, red, um, red fruit. Now a vintage, yep. a single quinta. This is 19, so it's the youngest vintage. The vintage usually is declared two years after the, the harvest. In uh, these grapes, we still use mannings doing the pijage. The robo works very well, but doesn't have feelings. Uh, you could work 24 hours a day, you never ask for more money, you, ne <laughs> you never was tired. But if we want to go in the direction of perfection, we must use men's doing that. It is a very hard job. Yeah, it's a very hard job. They have to go many hours. Yeah, for, you, he, he has. And, I, and I didn't do it that long. You stay there, stay there in, 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 uh, inside Lagarde's half an hour. Yeah. But thinking they must stay there three hours at oh least. Oh my goodness. He said very, very young, just bottled. Very, very young. Look, looking the color, it's still, it's dark. The aroma is very intense. A lot, a, lot, a lot of spicy, very balsamic. Spot on. Some cedar, some cigar. A wine prepared to live another years in bottle, but is is drinkable. So now a classic vintage, 
2018, one of the better year which I have the opportunity to to taste and to produce in all my life as a winemaker. It's beautiful to receive the 100 points, but uh, the best medal I could receive is going in a, in a, re in a restaurant, seeing the people uh, drinking a bottle of our company, and when they finish them, ask for another. A quite fresh, fresh year. This wine more than the others? Yes. Coach is, the is, is, is like to, to hit a stick, a, 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 a meat, to hit meat. I was going to say, it's very it's spicy like, on, yes, the spinach, spicy. on the finish. And it's, it's long and it's powerful. I'm very surprised all three of them now have had a really strong spice component. I'll never see how long that, that wine could live. Yeah. Because I part and the wine is still be for the, the, the next generations. What is beautiful is you do get a legacy yes, yes. in that and sense. So what, what do we have? So, now, as I didn't say, an uh, old vintage because is three years youngest as me. <laughs> I, I, and I think I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not old. It has been bottled in the same year as the men that arrived to, to, to the moon. These previous wines we have tasted, they are uh, a young, young wines that doesn't have sediments in bottle. So what we must do is decant them. Luis explained to me that the corks are replaced by hand every 25 to 30 years to keep the wine sound but that doesn't stop them from being fragile. After removing the cork, old wines like this are decanted as they tend to have a lot of sediment. Then Luis rinses the bottle and funnels the decanted wine back in. Look at, it's perfect. The color for a wine with 50, 55 years, the complexity is, oh is amazing. The fruit character goes into this Go, dry it goes, fruit it, is, it, it, it is disappeared uh, uh, yeah, and it starts to win what we call the bouquet. Yeah, bouquet. It's the, the aromas of which wine that wins in a in bottle. That happens after many years, uh, but but the complexity are are wonderful. That wine. They start to have some aromas like pharmacy, iodium. It turned from a wine that was you had those young wines that are very rich and mouth coating to a very light, La yes, easy light drinking. Easy. easy, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it stays in mouth for many, many The finish is so yes. long, so warming. And it's very, very spicy. Yeah, still spicy. And like you uh, said, that's kind of the- spicy, very spicy in mouth. I could drink that wine alone like that. In, during the winter, in a, a cool night, near the fire. Yeah. This, drinking this in your that thoughts. wine with, with a good conversation, eating some good cheese and drinking that wine is the best we can, we can have in the life. Speaking of the best you can have in life, Luis had one final surprise for me. I have here something special to you. This is a 1966. We have here a wine with more 103 years than that. 1863. Are you kidding? Eight, yes, yes, I, I, I'm not kidding. It's We're true. not going to open true. this, are it's we? True. Yes, it's true, it's true, <laughs> this is That's right, something. a bottle of 1863 Fajera Port. Nearly 160 years old, before the World Wars, before the Eiffel Tower, blue jeans and the light bulb were invented. A time when the U.S. was at civil war, only had 34 states, and the national anthem had yet to be written. When we say wine is history in a bottle, it's rarely this literal. Even the bottle has a story. This is a bottle made by hand. Looking at that bottle, the neck is, is not in a vertical position. The yeah, you can see kind of the divots. It's not perfect. The bottle is something amazing to look at the color. It's fantastic. Is a, is a wine to thinking, to talk, to discuss. The color is the thing that is, is absolutely blowing my mind. Just that beautiful amber gold. It looks like an aged, aged white. It looks like an aged Chardonnay. Oh, wow. This is the most over the top nose we've had all day. They have honey, 
that I own even, even more pronounced, farm, right? That farm is again. I had never said. heard that, but yes. that is that is exactly okay. what it is. It, it smells like a like an old pharmacy. Crushed flowers. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You still be alive. It it has this character almost like a, a bourbon with these beautiful vanilla caramel honey, rich, rich, rich extracted it's amber honey. This is a question of sensations. It's not only the quality of, of wine. It's, it's, it's the, the story. Mm -hmm. The story which is behind him is a wine not easy to describe, but only to say thanks to God to let, yeah, to give know. us to, to the possibility to taste a wine, a wine like that. To be grateful for that and to, and to be grateful for you for, for choosing to share this. I, uh, I, I very much appreciate it. This is one of the most special moments of my been life. A Thank you so much. Thank you very much. One of the most inspiring parts of trying this wine was this. The bottle was not only still sound, it was incredible. With no modern farming technology, no benefit of the metering and the measuring and the science of modern winemaking, the people of Vajera in 1863 managed to make a wine that lasted 160 years. And Luis now makes wines that will outlive him by the same. As I shared the bottle with Luis, the Vajera team, and the crew, I reflected on the journey it had taken and the fortune I'd had. The generations who passed it down one to the next, each saying, nah, don't open it yet. And I was the lucky man who someone looked at, Luis, luck, God, and said, now it's time. first time I visited Portugal, I had no idea what kind of food to expect. I thought maybe it would be similar to Spanish cuisine, but I quickly found out it was unlike any other European cuisine I had. It's hearty and rustic and rich, cured meats and smoked sausages, seafood, hearty vegetables and legumes, soups and stews. It uses lots of spices, many of which come from Portugal's former colonies, paprika, clove and cumin. Chef Rui Paula, wanted to take all of these amazing ingredients and spices from traditional northern Portuguese cooking and make something contemporary out of it. What came from that was DOC, his acclaimed restaurant in the gorgeous Douro River Valley. Beautiful view, huh? It's an amazing spot, yes? Yeah, there's there's worse places to have a restaurant, I'll tell you. Yes, it's all restaurant is on the river, you see? It's oh, on and the, the indoor too, yes, it's yes, over yes. the river. Yes, yes. Wow. It's, so, a, it's, a, it's not a boat. Yeah, it's a restaurant, huh? <laughs> and what made you decide to open here? I mean, you could have opened in Lisbon. I was born in Porto, but my family, it's the, this region. Yeah, your family's from here. Yes. So this was where you, because this is where your heart is. Yes. Yeah. You are a two Michelin star chef now. What inspires you as a chef? What made you? The, my family have a, a big house. My grandmother cook for many people. Big, big dinners. Yes, and <laughs> the flavors, the yeah. house, the, the smell. The, the business yeah. is uh, my inspiration. Yeah, so you wanted to take that experience and give people that same you know, joy that you had as a kid. Yes, you will. yes. You guys, you have some dishes prepared for today, yeah? Yes. Yeah? Want to go eat? But it's a, it's a, it's a secret. It's a secret? Yes, no, right. no, but after you try. <laughs> okay, good. Well, you want to do okay, it? Okay, come on. I had a feeling the food in the Douro was going to be just as good as the wines from here. That is lovely. And that is um, a reserve white. A reserve white. I mean, you would look white. at it, you would look at it and you think, oh, it's a tawny, but this is just an aged yes. white. I hope you like the food. Huh? I'm sure I will For me, the it. food is very important, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the wines is important, but the food. <laughs> Did I mention Chef Paolo really wants you to visit Portugal? <laughs> we have a reserve port yeah, in yeah. Portugal. Portugal is a beautiful country. <laughs> and 14 wine region. Why? 14. I'm, the quality price of the wines, beautiful. I love how, like I said, you are just the biggest advocate of Portugal I think I've met here. What is it? This, <laughs> it's a dirt, it's but like, it's not a dirt. Yeah, yeah obviously. <laughs> Underneath. A sauce of mushrooms, mushrooms, and egg. With okay. A, with a little sauce of the squid. Also, oh, it's a squid ink, um, like breadcrumb. Yes, you have you have chorizo also. Here, it's uh, mushrooms. Here, it's a fake truffle. Oh, fake truffle. Outside, it's a sauce of squid. Inside, it's a typical thing Portuguese. Only in Portugal you have bread, chicken, pork, 
and after this blend is smoked. Okay, and you okay. smoke it. I couldn't construct something to look this nice, even if it wasn't food. So the yes. fact that yes. <laughs> yes, you, you, yes, just that. Uh, okay, yes. mushroom right off the bat. Yes. Beautiful, beautiful yes. earthy mushrooms. The creaminess from the egg. Yes. I want to get a bite with the it's yolk. It's umami. And very, it's very it's umami. Of food. This is like a smoke bomb, and yeah. I love it. This, I yes. love it. Absolutely. It's almost like a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> now for the reserve. You oh, try. okay. Oh my gosh, you are 100% right. I think right. it's possible, yes? This because, one because when you think about it, what, is, what do people pair a lot with cigars, right? They like port for yes. that reason. You get that same effect with this. Yes. This is amazing. Yes, it is. <laughs> I have goosebumps, I'm so. The Fajera Dona Antonia Reserva White Port was floral, woodsy, fruity, and peppery. And it paired with the smoky, umami flavors wonderfully. This is a great example of how wines can elevate a dish. Port and cigars are a classic pairing because the strong, heavy cigar is balanced by the fruity port, but yet the port has enough weight to stand up to the intense smoke. And the smoked meat was really smoky, just like a cigar. And the saltiness of the squid ink was also complemented by the sugar in the wine. By the way, Chef was really impressed. I put together the cigar thing he was going for all on my own. And you speak, I, I, I not speak with him before. Yeah, right? yeah no, I didn't, I wasn't ah, prompted. He's not, he's not, he's uh, not, he's uh, not fake, huh? He's not fake. <laughs> we paired the main course with a table red from the Douro, Casa Fajarina's Quinta de Leda. Absolutely beautiful, fragrant cherries and flowers. Yes. Thank you. Many textures, the cauliflower. So this is this, this is raw, raw okay. pureed, raw. and, and, and uh, seared. Yes. Great. A sauce, the chic black pork. Black pork cheek. And the lardo. And lard. It's the same pork. That's the fat, same pork, that's the fat, the lard. Yes, the fat. Okay, so look at, look at how it shreds. I had a bite of the meat alone, and it just melts. Wow, when you get it with the lardo, it really does elevate it to, to the next level. I hope all of you get to try black pork this good in your lifetimes. The tannin in the wine matched with the fat of the pork, while the acidity cut through the fat of the lardo and the creaminess of the cauliflower. Wow, I mean, look at it. What is this? This is hazelnut and, uh, and isomal. Oh, I see the hazelnut in the hazelnut day. Hazelnut is here, yeah. and after you have isomal. Yeah, okay, it's, it's like a caramelized. Tea. Yes, chocolate, coffee, yeah. hazelnut. And I will say, port is, you know, you can pair it with other things, but it is, it's the best with dessert. If you have this wine, it's not the same with LBV or vintage. If you have an LBV or vintage. It's good for cheese. Oh, cheese, interesting. So the you, vintage. The stuff that's more serious, yes. let's do it yes. with savory. This, I know this wine. This wine is, is better for the coffee. Chocolate, but it's not a black chocolate. Yo, there's a there's a famous pairing in America, wedding cake and champagne. It's the worst pairing on the planet. <laughs> you have dry, acidic champagne no. with sweet wedding cake. Champagne you, for me is good with oyster, meat, fish. Yeah, yeah. But dessert is not mine. No, no. Because you have to, have to, have to have sugar in your wine to match sugar in dessert. You cannot have a sweet dish and have zero sugar in your wine. It's no good, it clashes. You got it. Sweet dishes need sweet wines to pair. It's why ports are so often the choice of restaurants around the world for their dessert pairings. Citrus and stone fruit desserts pair better with white ports, nutty and light chocolate desserts with tawnies like what we have here, and dark chocolate and berry desserts best with rubies. This region, uh, this region is beautiful and uh, because the Douro, it's unique in my opinion, yeah. it's unique. Obviously, there are you know the tabernas and there's casual food, but this is a treat. Um, both, I think, for obviously your guests and treat for me. Yes. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, and nice to meet. You. Thank you. And so ends our adventure in port. Is there any wine like it? You tell me you like a Cabernet, I'll find you a dozen wines in similar style. But port? No one can touch it. It's a wine that can be had casually in cocktails with friends or formally with meals. It can be part of your usual routine or part of a once in a lifetime experience. You can get a port from the year your child was born and trust that when you give it to him on their 21st birthday, it'll just be hitting its stride. Or get one from the year you got married and have it on your 60th anniversary. 
pass a bottle down two, three, four generations, knowing that you've got a time capsule with a piece of you attached. Or have some tonight, knowing that winemakers don't really care how you drink it, as long as it brings you joy. And while the people who make these wines may change, the tradition of port, like the Doro Valley itself, continues to endure. I hope you enjoyed the magic that is port, and we'll see you next time on V is for Vino. Here. Hope you enjoyed the episode. If you have a moment, follow us on Instagram. And if you really want to support, please consider joining Vino VIP on VSVino.com. It's our members only club with a ton of benefits. Thanks for watching and see you soon.